thought. You know, we're, we're, we're sort of poking a little fun at Florida because obviously it's sort of been the epicenter of uh, major migration over the past 20 or 30 years. And I'm reminded of a conversation I had with a German surgeon a couple of, well, 15 or 20 years ago. We were talking about death and dying, and of course, healthcare, and where we spend our money, and what's happening to the aging US population. And he turned to me and said, what is it about you Americans that you think you're never supposed to die? And he's right, and especially for our generation. And we really sort of put it off as, well, perhaps it really isn't inevitable. And so with that, we're watching demographics change. We watch how we consume products differently. We watch television change its marketing focus. And certainly while we're talking about healthcare reform um, in the public and in the media, uh, <coughs> we can't help but talk about how we consume our healthcare dollars and what should we spend things on. Um, I'm Nancy Snyder, and I'm a practicing surgeon. I have been most of my life a head and neck cancer surgeon, and I'm now at Penn. But most of my other life has been as a broadcaster. I was first with ABC News and now with NBC News. And that intersection between medicine and social policy and politics, I think, is really comes to fruition in, in a panel just like this as we really look at that intersection and what it means for those of us in this room and obviously as an aging population in this country. Uh, I, I cannot remember this exact number. I'm certain one of the panelists will have it about the fact that we are, for the first time, going to have more people over the age of 50 or 60 than young people. Our birth rates are dropped. We're living longer. And so we've really tipped. Our demographic scale has really tipped uh, just in the last five to 10 years. We are going to start down at the end with John first and then coming down toward me with presentations. John Zogby, who is CEO, uh, President and CEO of Zogby International, a large international marketing and research firm. You probably have read some of his pieces um, he's either been on Forbes.com, he's written for politics, one of the founding um, members and pub, and uh, I should say authors on the Huffington Post, Financial Times, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and because you are the only person with a PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> um, I'm going to let you set up the panel for us. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks. This is my second time here at the Aspen Health Institute, and it's great for me because no one ever invites me back, so it's um, nice. Then how did you get here? Um, I don't know. I just got this call yesterday oh, saying it was a whole the 911. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the way will be, can you see it? Yep. The Woodstock generation and Encore Living. You're going to learn more about those two terms. I call us Woodstockers, us baby boomers. Uh, part of the reason it's personal, I was at Woodstock, uh, which means I saw it all and did some of it. And it also means I lost the moral high ground with my son. Does it mean that you inhaled? <laughs> we well, just want to know, did you inhale? Uh, no, but I watched others. Oh. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, first of all, the methodology. This is a, a lengthy <laughs> online poll, a random sampling of a huge panel that we have that's already representative of, of American adults. It has a margin of error, plus or minus one and a half. Um, and it was conducted the third week in July. Now, these are the ways that I identify the generations. The private generation, and those are the years. The Woodstockers, baby boomers. The Nike generation, just do it, which I'll explain. Uh, and then the first global citizens, 1979 to 1990. First of all, the privates, really quickly, defined by patriotism and sacrifice, a long list of achievements, in fact, probably a longer list of achievements in their lives than baby boomers, except the, the privates were a lot uh, quieter about it. They are the ones that are leading the way, uh, leading us towards the way of what we no longer call retirement, we call encore living. And this now is defined by I want to learn, I want to travel, I want to teach, I want to mentor, I want to coach, I will want to do something that's larger than myself, and I now have the time to do it and, uh, and the focus to do it. The Woodstockers, 78 million of us defined by self-indulgence. In fact, we've had only two presidents, one defined by, um, by adolescent self-indulgence and the other one just defined by adolescent. Um, the uh, perpetual youth, 
wonderful article that I read a couple of years ago about a 60-year-old woman uh, becoming a grandmother for the first time. Don't call me grandma, call me Trish, was the name of, of the article. What's important about our group is that we could very well be the first age cohort to have one million of us reach the age of 100. That's a staggering figure. It means then that our thinking about us changes dramatically because um, we now have the prospect for many of us to be living long and healthy into our, our late 70s and 80s and even 90s. But clearly this is a group, my group, that's in need of a second act. It's very hard when the high point of your life was when you were 19. The Nikes. There's no good old days for this group. This group was born into an America that was coming apart at the seams. And very importantly, we lost the war, 1973. There, there were commodities, shortages. Um, there was stagflation. For the first time, we learned, they learned about families that were ending in divorce, divorces with divorce rates of one third to then one half by the late 1970s. Roe v. Wade, despite one's opinion about Roe v. Wade, this is the generation of kids that grew up in a world hearing, oh, we didn't want her. She was unplanned. Um, regardless of how you feel about the issue, personally, I'm not a psychologist, but that's a bitch of a thing for a kid to hear um, when they're not supposed to hear that. Uh, detachment and libertarian, they have no built-in attachments to any of our familiar institutions because they were born into a world when those institutions were coming apart. And so in many ways, the Nikes just do it. They start over. And then lastly, first global citizens. 56% of our kids, 18 to 30-year-olds, have passports and have traveled abroad. 25% of this group tell us, I expect, not hope or wish, I expect to live and work in a foreign capital at some point in my life. When we ask which phrase best identifies you, this group is as likely to say, I'm a citizen of the planet Earth, as they are to say, I'm a citizen of the United States. They're diverse and multicultural. Their friends are eclectic and multiracial. Three years ago, when we asked them, in your own words, you tell me what the United States of America will look like in 20 years. This was three years ago. The number one response was Barack Obama. They're mobile. Their mobility means that we have to change the way we build housing the way we think in terms of job retention, the way we think in terms of the family, and so many other things. I think it was worth it to describe the differences among these groups as we then focus on Woodstockers. So these are the questions. To all adults, to what age do you expect to live to? The blue is the age that they expect to live to. And you see that only 5% expect to uh, reach less than 70, we re reach a crescendo, 20%, 70 to 79, and 41% expect to make it somewhere into their 80s. A total of 35% expect to reach uh, uh, 90 or above. At what age do you expect to uh, live and be healthy and fit? And those are pretty exciting numbers as well. For a kid who grew up in an old Italian neighborhood where when women turned 60 they were wearing black and their lives were over. Um, in fact, a Pew Research survey was just taken asking people, when does old age begin? 18 to 29 year olds said 60. <laughs> and those of us who are 60 and over said 74, which doubly depressed me. Number one, that's what our kids think of us. And number two, that I'm old enough now to think that it's 74 and that it's not where I am right now. To what expect, uh, these are Woodstockers alone. What age do you expect to live to? Well, only 70 of us expect to die in the next few years. But look at us. Again, 39% the, uh, into the 80s, 33% of us expect to live 90 or above, healthy and fit. Well, 20% of us expect to be healthy and fit into our 90s. Add another 31% expect to live in our 80s. This is a revolution in expectations. 
view exercise. Well, overall, 48% uh, told us that they exercise daily or several times a week. Now, it varies between the dailies and the uh, several times a week. Look at the first globals. Not much daily, but 38% several times a week. But look at the Woodstockers. 17% daily and 34% several times a week, and overall just slightly higher than any other group. That could be the perpetual age uh, uh, youth syndrome that we identify with. We're the ones that made L'Oreal necessary, just for men. I, I, I love the guys that I run into at reunions, you know, like me with the turkey necks and the very bad hands, but that hair is so tastefully brown. Um, <laughs> In retirement, can you afford to do something for little or no pay, or do you need significant income? Really interesting. Overall, say little or no pay, and 36% significant income. But look at, as we get older, Woodstockers can afford with little or no income, they tell us. 46% will need significant income. That's a reverse from the private generation. That's why we're redefining. Hmm? Uh, this was done just uh, a couple of weeks ago. After the crash. Oh, yeah, after the crash. <laughs> yeah, we no longer talk retirement. <laughs> Write this down. Encore living is what we call it now. There's actually a website that, that's very good. Um, all adults in retirement, what do you plan to do? These are all adults now. 34% expect to travel, 25% to volunteer, 9% to relax. 18, 28% either not retire or get another job. That's very substantial. Let's now look at our Woodstockers. 23% want to travel, uh, even though double that would like to do it. But not retiring, 37% plan to either not retire or to get another job. There is, there is a youth and a vitality but there's also a difference here. Robert Fogel, the historian, underscores it when he calls it the shift to vol work, away from earn work. And I love the term. There is a secular spiritualism that is growing in this country. I explain a lot of it in great detail in my book. But Woodstockers in particular are looking for this secular spiritualism as the second act that they need, that they feel they need to redeem themselves in their lives, to move away from self-indulgence to living something larger and not retiring or getting another job. Some of that's for economic reasons, but some of that is also for very personal reasons as well. What do you expect your lasting legacy to be? 57% overall said an authentic life. Only 25% said family and friends and smaller numbers, money and estate or career achievements. And now, by generation, your lasting legacy, those who said an authentic life, 47% of First Globals, 53% of Nikes, 62 and 65% of, um, of Woodstockers and privates wanting an authentic life as their legacy. Healthcare reform, since we're talking about it so much, uh, Universal Plan A would require everyone in the U.S. to have health insurance with federal help for those who can't pay premiums. Universal Plan B, the government would provide health insurance for everyone in the U.S. under a single-payer plan, similar to everyone having Medicare for all. Um, Universal Plan A and B split, as we always find with when it comes to solutions about health care reform. There is a mandate for change, but absolutely no agreement on the details. 48, 49, universal plan B um, is 52% who disagree, 48% who agree. Agree with health care reform proposals. First globals, very high. Very few of them have health insurance. Nikes, Woodstock generation, and privates. You see where there's little chance of any mandate there. In your opinion, will Social Security be available for you? 
you see that Woodstockers and, of course, privates are much more positive and sanguine about it. Our poor globals and Nikes are not. In your opinion, will Medicare be available for you? Uh, again, big difference between Woodstockers and Nikes, but then a very large difference between them and everyone else. How about for your children? That's the red. Very few believing that. In caring for you as you age, something you expect your children to do? Yes, Woodstockers and privates, very few expect it. Higher among first globals, and I have a theory. I told you it's our kids that are traveling abroad and have this wonderful planetary sensibility. That's because it's us Woodstockers who have funded it. And so they are accustomed to being taken care of. I'm being a little harsh, but otherwise I'm very high <laughs> on the first globals. What will be the historic legacy of baby boomers? Really interesting result. Blue is lasting social and cultural change and or an era of consumerism and self-indulgence, and gray is no real legacy. Look at the, the, the two groups that agree with each other the most are the Woodstockers, and we've taught our kids very, very well, haven't we? Because they're the only ones that agree with us. So as we move on, oh, thanks to my shameless uh, uh, self-promoting um, staff, with, you know, with Labor Day, Yom Kippur, and Ramadan just around the corner, what more thoughtful gift can there possibly be? <laughs> Spoken and like a true marketer. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And I'm very happy to then explain and comment on that stuff. And we will do that at the end of everyone's uh, presentation. Thank you very much. That was a great way to start things off. Lisa's up next, vice president with AstraZeneca. She has been um, had a history in politics working for the Clinton-Gore um, re-election campaign in 96. Also uh, has been involved with the American Bar Association for many, many years. And uh, also the AARP. You've done a little bit of everything. Pretty much. I'm a true boomer. <laughs> and with that, okay. I want to start with the good news, and that is that people turning 50 today have at least 50 more years left in life. So when you guys in the audience turn 50, you know <laughs> that you got another 50 to go. So what that really means, if you look at it, is kind of congratulations in order, because what that really speaks to is the fact that you're now beneficiary of the longevity bonus. And while the old definition of longevity bonus used to be that you would get a bonus based upon the years worked, the new definition is all about the simple fact that what has expanded are the active years versus the end of life years. So the question we're talking about today is what really is going to make your stay here much better. So first I want to start with this. I don't have a snappy PowerPoint, but at AstraZeneca we did some research a couple of years ago. So think about a circle. And we found what our reputation and our keys to continued business success were. So in that circle, if you draw a line halfway across, maybe a little bit more than halfway across, it really is about the quality of what we do. Our products, whatever it is that's being delivered, that's the secret to success. Interestingly enough, 28% of that circle is all about corporate integrity, which is how you go about doing what you do. And the last piece had to do with compassion. Do you understand and care about your audience beyond the simple transaction? As we talk about what life is going to be like when we get to be 50 and on and on and on, Essentially, it's going to go back into those three buckets. A perfect solution is going to have to be somewhere within those three buckets. So let's just start with a couple of top-line thoughts, and then maybe during the discussion we can go into more detail. What is needed? First, we do need major health care reform in the United States. There's no doubt about it. When you look at the numbers, the facts, the figures, the demographics, the desires, we really have to do it. And today, there's debate going up and down the spectrum, who's up, who's down, what policies, what practices are going to be involved in it. But I want to put on the table that there's just a couple of things that ought to underpin whatever comes out from health care reform. First and foremost, it's got to be quality care with an emphasis on 
outcomes. We can talk more about that. Number two, we've got to ensure patient safety that it's maintained and it's enhanced. Number three, expand coverage for the uninsured. <clears throat> and we have to address the underinsured. And number four, we do have to continue to foster and reward innovation. We've got to look at ways that we are continuing to support new advancements in how we treat and what we treat and how we're actually helping people engage in life. So that's the first thing as we start looking for about preparing the nation for a population explosion of, of baby boomers. The second thing is because health care is as much an economic issue as it is a wellness issue, we've got to look at exactly how we're going to do that in the right way. In short, cost can't be the enemy of quality, and quality can't be the enemy of cost. Now, I have some specific ways about how we can get there, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Third, you've got to continue a focus on health in the younger and the youngest years, because that old adage of how you start is how you finish is true. When you look at every number, every statistic, every desire, it really is grounded in what happens long before you get to old age. So we've got to look at that as a focus, too. People ask questions about what about Medicare, what about Social Security. When you get there, and if that's the focus of it, and you hear that in debate, we're too late when we start talking about how we're going to deal with it. Policies, yes. Practices, as well. I will just throw out this one little statistic, and that is 32 percent of children and teens today are considered overweight or obese. One more quick statistic from the CDC, actually. 75 percent of every health care dollar goes towards a chronic disease. It's the most expensive, but it's also the most treatable, and it's grounded in what happens when you're young and how you're managing your life and your lifestyle. Fourth, we're talking today, and Nancy alluded to it a little bit in her opening remarks, we're talking today about how to get the world ready for a Florida-type explosion. And that makes some sense because in the United States, Florida has been the state that's pretty much seen as leading the way when it comes to dealing with diversity and diver dealing with age. But the truth is, I want to keep that challenge on us to think and learn globally. There are countries who have gotten there and who will get there long before us in the United States. And we can't really discount that conversation. Debates rage over who's got the best system. Um, and I'll tell you a story. Our global CEO, David Brennan, came from the United States. Our home office is in London. When he got there, he met with a high-level health official. And he asked him in London, he said, where is the best health care in the UK? And this is the true answer. He said, you go to Concourse 5 at Heathrow Airport and take a plane to the United States. That was the true answer. Now. Interestingly enough, in 1991, the World Health Organization actually did do a survey ranking system, world systems of health care. France and Italy were one and two. United States, 37. We were 37. Since that time, the Commonwealth Fund has continued to look at it. And across the spectrum, the UK is actually supposed to be better than the United States in a number of key factors when it comes to dealing with health, health care, and moving forward. So there's something that we can learn from, another, from other countries. Now, it has never worked in history, and I don't care what you're talking about, where we try to take one society's norms and practices and just drop them on another culture. We go through wars on that, and it never really works. What we have to think about is picking and choosing, because there are some lessons and there are things that can be embedded in our system, and there are things in our system that can be embedded in others. So the truth is, who has the best system is irrelevant. So I'll wrap it up this way. And I'll say common in all of this really is the mindset. It goes back to that circle. How are we actually coming into each piece of that circle? Delivery of whatever it is. How are we doing it in a way that meets societal norms and expectations? And when we get to end of life care, if we talk about that, that's a whole other situation that we can have a conversation about. And finally, compassion. How do we do it in a way that really does 
undermine and underscore everything that we want to be as people. So the last story I'll leave you with is former AARP CEO Bill Novelli tells a story where he went to Kentucky. And he was giving a talk, and there was a woman who stood up and said, Mr. Novelli, do you realize that women outlive men? And he said, yes. And then she said, so tell me what you're going to do about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the answer to that question is that we all have something to do about that. And as we continue to change and learn and grow, we'll put those answers on the table. So with that, I'll stop and move to my colleague. And like I said, we can get into some of the details and the specifics a little bit later on. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Peter Long is a special assistant to the CEO of the Kaiser Family Foundation and has done something else beyond that that I think is really, really interesting. And he, he uh, spearheaded the California Endowment in California, which really addressed getting children in California insurance. And uh, I'm a big fan of the Kaiser Family Foundation, so take it away. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to belie my Nike status and uh, will not just do it. I'm going to talk about some critical institutions uh, in America, A, because that's what we do at Kaiser. We look at uh, some institutional uh, government programs in particular in financing. And I think, um, building on Lisa's remarks, I think we need to look at the future and need to plan for the future. But we've got some serious issues, political, economic issues, we need to deal with today. Because as John said, there are a lot of people with expectations who are living longer, um, particularly with respect to the healthcare system. And we need to figure out how we're going to pay for it, how we're going to organize that. Um, and that's a today problem. I want to spend just the last minute saying something that we should solve tomorrow's problem. And I couldn't echo more loudly Lisa's point about the life course approach. And thinking about, um, it seems contrarian, and maybe because my wife's a pediatrician, I've done a lot in child, child health and I have three young kids, but it really is critical what we do in the first five, ten years of life. Um, there's, a, there's a growing and very substantial body of research that says that has implications when we're 60, 70, 80. Um, and my own research shows that um, many things beyond the healthcare system actually are much more uh, stronger determinants of your uh, physical and mental health and your mortality your physical activity levels, your smoking patterns, your social networks um, are more, insure, uh, more important than health insurance and the usual, do, usual source of care. But let me get to today's problem because it's real and it's happening and we can't avoid it. Um, and I would describe it uh, as a political economic problem. The first is Medicare. Um, we all hear the statistics, we read it in the paper, that Medicare Part A is going to go insolvent in eight years. Um, that's a big challenge for us, the hospital trust fund which pays for hospital care. And why is that important? Um, part of it is important because I think it feeds into John's numbers about people have very little expectation that Medicare will actually be able to fulfill its obligations going forward. This was a 40-year-old agreement, a social contract between the government and the citizens that said if you work and you pay into the fund and you reach age 65, now 67, we will take care of your hospital bills. We'll help you. You will not go bankrupt. We're not going to tell the AMA or other doctors how to practice, but we will help you not go bankrupt. Well, that is being reworked right now. And one of the critical challenges is between balancing between the fiscal sol solvency of the nation, um, which you have issues like the trust fund going broke in eight years or becoming insolvent, with the burden placed on American seniors and American families right now after the economic crisis that we're facing, um, people have stopped talking about a V-shaped recovery or even a U-shaped recovery from this recession. I think that we're looking at an L-shaped recovery or something that's uh, much more gradual, which I think is pretty distressing for folks in their 60s and 70s who their IRA, you know, their retirement accounts have been decimated and they don't have 20 or 30 years to repay that. With the rising cost of health care, we've got a train wreck happening that we need to think of solutions that both solve the financial crisis for the, the government that Medicare is projected to be 6% of our total federal outlay by 2030. 6% of all of our total federal outlay, that's everything the government does, will be going toward <coughs> Medicare. Um, at the same time, families are paying an average, or individuals are paying an average of $4,000 themselves out of pocket to make up the difference of what Medicare doesn't cover. Um, so one of our challenges as a nation is to figure out how do we solve those problems simultaneously. And I agree in a sense with Lisa that we need health care reform. And the good news is, and most of the work on Medicare has said that it's not the aging population. We're not the problem because we're getting older and living longer. Uh, we may be a problem because of our expectations, but it's really the underlying health care cost, which I think actually is a very good news answer. I know people at Kaiser are very relieved to hear that because 
if we can solve the healthcare cost issue, not a trivial, uh, not a trivial uh, endeavor, but if we can solve that healthcare cost issue, then we actually can begin to solve the Medicare problem, both the financial problem of the country and of individuals. So it's not, we're not doomed that we all get older and we're just gonna spend more money that we can't afford. Um, but I do think we urgently need to, as a nation, have that conversation about Medicare. One of the things that will be very tricky about health care reform, you heard the president talk this week about the savings. Um, we'd much rather do this through savings than through taxation or redistribution of wealth. Well, if you look where those savings are coming from, it's a lot of it is in Medicare. Um, it's payment rates to health plans, the Medicare Advantage. It's changing payments to doctors. Um, those have real implications for people's access to care. I mean, some of it you can probably wring some waste out of the system, but we need to think carefully as we uh, work on health reform that we're not bankrupting Medicare or you know, expecting access for seniors in order to pay for the expansion of health care, uh, health insurance to people 18 to 64. Um, the second point I want to make is long-term care, and I think that's one that just gets so little airtime, but that's the real issue in a sense of um, our country, and it's one of the you know, kind of largest issues in terms of people's actual care in their lives, but also financially. Um, and I think we, as a nation, need to stop thinking about long-term care as nursing homes. That's 1.5 million people, mostly women over 85. It's an incredibly important population. We need to think of the long-term care continuum about helping people age in place. We need, I mean, I think the bill in the House that was just uh, the H.R. 3200 has an interesting provision about a voluntary contribution to do supportive services to keep people in the community and assistive, uh, you know, kind of assistive living. Um, but I think we need to think about long-term care, but not just about private long-term care insurance, or not just about it as a kind of typical health insurance model. The one thing I would say, good news to John's point, is that 80% of us actually receive, 80% of seniors receive some support free um, from their friends and family. So people are, uh, there is a sense of community around long-term care. And I think we need to capitalize on that um, and move it forward. The third issue, which is not a Kaiser issue, but I think it's so big and so pressing, and frankly, it's hard to believe that we've neglected it, is the workforce issue. And we just don't have enough people who specialize in geriatric care, whether it's from physicians, pharmacists, dentists, to in-home support services. Um, the workforce just isn't there, and the, gen the general workforce hasn't been trained for geriatric care. Um, that's shocking to me. We know how to <laughs> solve that problem. It's through medical education, through incentives. Um, we've changed dramatically the shift between specialist and primary care physicians. We can change in terms of number of cardiologists. Um, those policy tools exist, so it's somewhat mystifying to me how we know this problem's happening, we know there's a workforce shortage, and yet we haven't really been aggressive in uh, expanding the workforce and improving the training and providing benefits, frankly, to in-home workers. Um, one of the statistics from the IOM report is they make about a dollar an hour <coughs> more than uh, retail counter food sales. Um, is that really the priority that we place on in-home support services for our parents and grandparents and ourselves? Um, so I think that's an issue that needs immediate attention. And then I think within that, um, it's another shocking statistic in the IOM, I just was floored by this, is how little take up there's been on the PACE model. I mean, the PACE model has proven that's not the only model, but we have very successful models of care out there that are integrated, that integrate acute care, long-term care, supportive services, and I mean, there's also financing for it. Medicare and Medicaid have actually worked on the financing models. Um, but the uptake on these kind of innovations and the things that I think are really going to transform care for seniors uh, hasn't happened. And I think that's something that should be a priority um, with or without health care reform. So as I said, I think we should focus on today's problems. And they're real. They're political, economic. But they're solvable. And then I also think at the same time we should put a lot of money into the upstream determinants. Um, and we should not pretend that when we hit age 65 or we hit age 50 or 70 that that our health begins or doesn't begin and our quality of life begins or doesn't begin. We really need to do a lot more work about understanding people's health trajectories and really promoting a culture of health in the country as opposed to kind of solving these problems. That's not the long-term solution. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, Mark Gans is up next. He is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield based out of Portland, a not-for-profit, correct? Yes. A life and uh, health insurance company um, covering about 3 million people between Oregon, uh, Washington, Idaho, and Utah, and also chairs the Aspen Institute Health Stewardship Project. Good morning. Uh, as I sit here today, uh, um, my mother is nearing the end of her life. And so I keep my cell phone very close um, and uh, get updates from my brothers and sisters, uh, and we keep each other informed. Um, 
and figuring out what we can do to ensure uh, that her way to her death is a graceful and dignified one. Uh, I'm sure that all of you can relate to that uh, in your families. Um, what I'm here to talk about is how difficult sometimes that is uh, to engineer and help a parent or a loved one uh, to a graceful and dignified death. And uh, so a couple stories about that we, our families experienced just within the last, um, say, three or four years, and particularly in the last few months. Uh, as my mother has dealt with a series of chronic uh, diseases, uh, most particularly congestive heart failure and COPD, and the kind of wearing impact that has on her body, uh, the thing that we have had to uh, deal with most often with the healthcare system has been uh, the tendency for her to become over-medicated. Uh, that various of her physicians, uh, because there isn't, she does have a primary care physician, but, but, but the primary care physician is not truly a quarterback in today's healthcare system. Uh, and because she has many specialists, or then she you know, has an issue where she has to go in the hospital and then is, has a hospitalist uh, treating her who's never seen her before. She has tended to come out of those experiences with a lot of different kinds of medication, which actually create problems of their own. Most recently, as she's been nearing the end of her life, we've been dealing with uh, what I think is also a real cultural issue within healthcare, uh, within the healthcare delivery uh, and financing system which is the tendency to want to view death as an enemy. Death as, uh, that in, in when a physician calculates their win-loss record, the death of a patient is a loss, not necessarily a natural progression of a person's life. And so um, a vignette from just uh, 10 days ago, my mother crashed, uh, needed to go into the hospital for a short period of time in order to get stabilized. While she was there, a series of tests were done on her, um, questionable necessity uh, and very expensive, but nonetheless done. And in the course of that, they discovered um, an issue uh, in her intestine, a potential tumor. And so uh, we talked with her about it, and she was very firm. And one of the great things about my mom is that spiritually she's in a wonderful place and, and, and sharp as a tack mentally. She knows exactly what's going on, and she uh, is, is ready, if you will. Uh, and so we said, do you want to do anything to follow up on this test, which would have been necessarily a colonoscopy, which in her frail condition might kill her on its own. And she said, of course not. There's nothing that that's going to do for me. I know where I'm, I'm at, and, and of course, I just want to go home. Uh, the next morning when we weren't there, um, a hospitalist come, came in, a young physician and said, well, we found this issue on the CT scan. Didn't, by the way, had not reviewed her broader, her broader medical record and, and said, well, we're going to schedule you for a colonoscopy. And my mother said, no, I don't want a colonoscopy. I'm, I'm fine, thank you. And she, she proceeded at her uh, age of nearly 81 to be basically berated by the physician as to how dare you not get a colonoscopy. My gosh, this is how you, don't you want to know what you have, and there are ways that we can treat this. And thank God that my mom, being sharp and being centered, knew exactly what to say, and she just patiently said, no, I don't want that, and, and eventually won the day. Uh, my brother, who's a physician who came in later and found out about this, took another step um, with respect to that hospitalist, uh, with respect to how she treated my mother. I wish I could say that that was unusual but it's not. And we see this play out. Uh, I saw a similar action with my father when he passed about five years ago, similar kinds of situation, and I have countless friends who have told me of similar stories. And in their more uh, honest moments, many hospital executives and physicians will admit to the same kind of thing. And the common theme is they don't know how to talk with patients about, about their dying. And so they revert to curative treatment as the answer. And, and it's because they, didn't, they weren't trained in it in medical school, they weren't trained in it in residencies, they don't know how to 
to, to engage. So about when, when I became CEO of our company, I decided that this was something that we were going to do our damnedest to start impacting. Not because it has really much to do with what we do on a day-to-day -day basis in a direct way, but because it's an area that is often overlooked. And believe me, everyone in this room has a stake in the outcome of where this goes. Because I don't think any of us want to die in a hospital with a bunch of tubes coming out of our body. I think we would all, if we had the opportunity, would want to die at home, or surrounded by family and our friends in a peaceful, dignified way. I should also note that I'm from the great state of Oregon, which was the first state in this country to adopt physician-assisted suicide, followed next by Washington where our former governor was the, of Washington was the primary mover in the state to, a, to get that law passed. I see that as, as the ultimate statement by people of desiring self-control at the end of life. They feel controlled by a system. They feel that they don't have self-determination. And they've chosen what I think is a sorry, uh, un, uh, unhelpful approach to say that the way I'm going to exert self-control is to take the ultimate act of self-control, which is ending my life on my own terms in that respect. I see that as a response to a huge gap that we have in our healthcare delivery system with respect to palliative care. And that if we had a robust uh, uh, approach, a well-centered and ethical approach to how we train physicians and train healthcare professionals in palliative care, and, and if there was a, a way of people being able to uh, have those conversations at the right time in a sensitive way for people to be able to make those decisions and then be cared for in a supportive way, then they, the, the notion of, of physician assistant suicide would not be even being discussed in this country. We would have a much more ethical and focused and productive view. So we establish a foundation and we are driving the, uh, the development of palliative care centers of excellence throughout the, our four states. And we are also announcing uh, here shortly, more broadly, I guess you'll be the first to hear of it uh, publicly, the establishment of, a, of a, what we hope to be a very prestigious uh, award that will be, or a series of awards that will be given out every year to highlight those who are practicing, who are the paragons of practicing and de developing and then implementing palliative care systems in and throughout the hospitals within our four states. And ultimately, we, we hope that we'll take it nationwide. It is just amazing that there are so few of them um, throughout our system and that, that hospitals that do have them, they are kind of done off the corner of the desk and with very little funding and very little expertise uh, being brought to it. And so our goal is to, uh, one, we've started the first two years just learning from those who are further ahead and have developed these kinds of centers. And then develop bringing the competency into our foundation to then partner with hospitals that don't have or have very fledgling uh, programs and bring it forward. I think it's one of the great uh, uh, gaps that is happening in the healthcare reform discussion today, that we are talking about, if you will, developing a system that is going to continue to be focused on cure, 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 you know, what and how can we get more access to people having more medical interventions. And what we, the opportunity that we have in an, ep, in an effort of health stewardship is to develop a, a, a more broad base that is a balance between curative care therapies and palliative care therapies with an eye toward treating the whole patient and helping them, helping us understand as a nation that death is a part of life, that none of us are going to get out of this alive, and that we need to help create a way uh, to uh, help people die as gracefully as we hope that they will live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Marty Payson is currently a managing partner of Karl Marx Healthcare Partners and chair of Maimonides Medical Center and former vice chair of um, time one of them. Uh, in the dialogue of this session, I'm a private, the only private on the panel, and essentially I fit your profile. 
I retired uh, 17 years ago from Time Warner and have gone on to a second career. I was 57 at the time. Uh, his profile is exactly right, and it's been a largely a volunteer, but it's been a career nevertheless. I've been profiled in the American Hospital Association. It said Martin Payson, second career, distressed hospitals. <coughs> I chaired two hospitals in the New York City metropolitan area. The one we're going to talk about mostly here, relevant to this subject, is Maimonides Medical Center. Uh, the other one is the public hospital system in Nassau County, Long Island. Uh, the only public hospital, including a nursing home, the largest, used to be the largest nursing home in the state. Um, in addition, I've been chairing the healthcare at uh, Howard University at its hospital for a number of years and have chaired the health sciences at uh, Tulane University up to and through the Katrina tragedy. So as a layman, I've had a second career. I didn't recognize it until AHA uh, mentioned it. Uh, but I'm not a professional, so my talk will, uh, will really relate to the points uh, that uh, Mark just made in his mother's experience. Uh, there, is, there are hospitals that are doing just what he wishes to do. Um, maybe not many. Maimonides Medical Center is a 700-bed teaching tertiary hospital in the center of Borough Park, Brooklyn. Brooklyn has between 2.5 and 2.7 million people and an extreme of age. We, we hear we have a lot of the, uh, the, the um, what's the term for the youth? We have a lot of young uh, professionals, but we have an enormous amount of immigrants, we have an enormous amount of elderly, and we have a huge birth rate. At Maimonides, we deal with the extremes of age. We have the largest birthing center in the state of New York. 8,000 babies were born there last year. So if you're worried about children being born, come to Maimonides because the, okay, we, have, we are in the center of the ultra-Orthodox community uh, in Brooklyn. But we also have one of the largest Chinese populations. We have Pakistanis. We speak seven, 67 languages 24-7. And if you're really interested in the subject, there's a book I recommend to you. It's not here. I'd ask them to put it here called Hospital. It's a, uh, we gave a report to Julie Solomon of the New York Times, uh, one year of unfettered access to the hospital, and she wrote a book about treating for this <coughs> population. 25% of our patients are 75 years of age or older. 15% are 85 years of age or older. So geriatrics is extremely important in our mission. Uh, the mission becomes very important. Do you want to treat them or not? Do you want to get through them? Uh, we clearly want to treat them and treat them compassionately. Uh, it is a key program at Maimonides Medical Center, and it's being recognized by the state and lots of authorities. Uh, there are a few points, because I'm not the professional. I'll just keep this at the late point. Okay, as we know, elderly patients suffer from chronic diseases. This is very important. They are not served well when medical treatment is delivered in an acute, episodic basis by different clinical specialists, often in multiple settings. Uh, what we have, okay, and these patients need compassionate and ongoing management provided by a geriatric team that can meet their trust and their needs. This means that they're actively working with parents, family members, and other clinicians to coordinate care, particularly when patients move from one setting to another. Uh, we recruited from Mount Sinai Hospital, which has another major geriatric program, a fabulous woman named Barbara Paris. She didn't come to Maimonides in Brooklyn from Mount Sinai in New York for the prestige, nor certainly not for the money, but she came because we had the client base. People like this are dedicated. We serve the largest surviving Holocaust population in the United States. Uh, these, of this 25% of our patients, more than half of them are impoverished. They've come from Europe, they've come from China, they've come from Pakistan, uh, and they need tender and compassionate care. Uh, the, we have what's called an acute care for the elderly area, it's ACE unit. It's an ACE unit 
is a unit that's organized around a multidisciplinary team that includes geriatricians, geriatric nurses, wound care specialists. Sounds as if a wound care specialist could be just a break in the skin. Can be very, very detrimental. Case managers, physical and occupational therapists, and nutritionists. Together they develop an integrated care plan that takes advantage of their different expertise and actively involves family members. Our family caregiver program educates and trains family members as soon as the patient is admitted in how to best care for their loved one while in their hospital and when they go home. We must also reach beyond the hospital. Here we have focused on managing the care of patients to keep them out of the hospital whenever possible. I want to say that we do this despite the fact that reimbursement by Medicare has been limited in that it pays for the sophisticated inpatient care and relatively little for care that takes place beyond our doors, especially in the patient's home. A decade ago, we started a con congestive heart failure program to help keep these patients from being readmitted to the hospital. We reorganized our conventional delivery of cardiac services into a co coordinated care management program with trained nurses reaching out to the cardiac patient and their family, stressing prevention and early intervention. The nurse makes sure that patients measure their blood pressure, take their medication, and generally follow what the doctor has told them to do to take care of themselves. As a result, we reduced our readmission rates by more than one half, lowered our average length of stay, and reduced inpatient hospital mortality. Uh, we have a companion program called Safe at Hope Program. It starts in the hospital. While the patient is still in the hospital, we start working between the social <laughs> worker and a nurse. And that social worker and the nurse follow the patient okay, after they leave the hospital, educating the parents. And, and on the following basis, when the or children, when they come back and they leave the hospital, immediate calls. I spoke to Dr. Paris in preparation for this. This is one of the most, said, what is a lack of information on the coordinated care. They come in with all these pills. They have all these medications at home, and they get other medications okay, in the hospital. Part of our Safe at Home program is to okay, go through that medicine cabinet, see what there is, and give them one uniform thing. Getting rid of what has to be get rid of sounds easy, and it is easy, but it has to be done. The incident about the person and the uh, colonoscopy would not, mistakes can happen in any hospital, but generally would not happen under our program because the hospitalists, we have hospitalists, would be trained in geriatrics and would know about this patient. Uh, so the Safe at Home, okay. A team member is available to the patient or caregiver 24-7 to address urgent medical conditions or schedule next day appointments and thereby eliminate the need to go to our emergency room. When our patients move into nursing homes, rehab, or receive visiting nurse service, we talk to the new clinicians to make sure that they fully understand the patient's condition and course of treatment. And the final part of the sort of integrated is information. Uh, uh, we have been uh, received grants from the state of New York, and they have a program in New York um, called HEAL. The state of New York issued a billion dollars of bond payments for the health care delivery system to use in closing hospitals, efficient care, and a significant portion of this is going into information technology. And Maimonides has been granted some significant grants to lead Brooklyn hospitals, not for us, and it's a separate group called the Brooklyn Health Information Exchange which is setting up a regional exchange of information technology, and all the hospitals are involved with it. We are the leadership role, but it has its separate board, so that all of the clinicians at all the different hospitals and nursing homes will have a common data bank and information regarding each of the patients in this group of hospitals, not just an old hospital. So the, the doctor, the individual doctor can access it, and eventually, have a record for the patient themselves, which they can travel with. Martin, if I could break in there, because I'd like to get a lot of enough time for the right. audience to participate. I'd like to kick this off by going back to the, your very poignant story about your mother and the fact that we do spend the majority of our healthcare dollars in the last year of someone's life. So how do we then broach the subject as we're watching the healthcare debate play out to talk about saying no to extravagant expenditures, that end the dying is sometimes not as bad as being poked and prodded, mm -hmm. to those who will say that all we want to do is off people, 
and really start to change the conversation so that those healthcare dollars that are many times wasted can be reallocated in a smarter way. So I'll, I'll lead off and say that to me, uh, healthcare reform is not what's going on in Congress. Uh, it is for, it, for us to have sustainable reform that is truly leads to a more just system is a cultural shift that has to occur within the healthcare system starting there. Uh, and I mean every sector of the healthcare system. And in the broader society as to what we what our expectations are and what our what our sense is of our role within with respect to the healthcare system. That's what has is the brokenness in healthcare that we face today. And that isn't going to get solved by uh, by the kinds of policy discussions that are generally uh, prevailing in DC. I think that the opportunity is to um, have what I would call policy surgical strikes that will cause different conversations to occur in the boardrooms, if you will, of uh, the various entities who play in healthcare and start causing um, people to say, say at a hospital, that it is in their interest, in their, both their business interests and their, their sense of community interest, to be more focused and do the training of people uh, with respect to how to transition when, it's, uh, when the time comes, to have that conversation with families, with patients, about when is it right to transition from curative to, say, palliative care. I don't think that you do that through a blunt force instrument that says we're going to tell you when, you know, that someone's going to tell you when you can get that treatment. Believe me, I'm in the business that for 50 years has used blunt force, and I don't buy into that. I don't think it, if you look at health care expenditures in this country, I think we've proven that blunt force does not work when culture isn't aligned with it. And the opportunity that we have is to come up with a ways through either direct funding of uh, these kinds of um, game-changing, uh, culture-changing uh, initiatives, as well as, uh, so direct funding, as well as changing the incentives that cause rational business people, what, in whatever sector they are, to change the decisions they're making and invest in different places. And, and, I, and I really think that's what <coughs> has to happen. And I do think that policy has a minor role to play in that, in terms of being able to help change that game. As I look for your hands out here, John, I know you had your hand up and then Lisa and then. Yeah, really quickly, I, I absolutely agree that it's cultural change. But you know, cultural changes and institutional transformations take place from the bottom up and seldom historically from the top down. You know, and I love to tell this little anecdote. I, I was picking up meds a couple of years ago. The woman in front of me we had a walker. She told me she was 85 years of age. She was right ahead of me, and she was arguing with the pharmacist. And the pharmacist was telling her about a certain set of, of, um, of problems with the medication, and the woman was saying, no, didn't exist. And then she reached into her purse, and she said, I downloaded this information, and I want you to see it. And she was empowered, and she won. And that's basically how the cultural change takes place. I don't see it uh, honestly happening in boardrooms until consumers demand it. I'm going to start. If you, everyone would stand up and just identify themselves. Okay. Yeah. And um, where are you from?
issues, but I would like to get your reaction as to how the sandwich generation can play a better role. Thanks, Nancy. Mm -hmm. yes. okay. um, it is an interesting issue, but I'll, I'll throw this out first. One fifth of all beta boomers don't have children. Um, so now you sit there and think about, so how is the system going to be able so to So who will take care of them? <laughs> exactly. So it's, it's a larger question, and it actually gets to what um, we heard down here. And that has to do with the fact that it's not just about in geriatric care where you need to have accountable uh, management of treatment. It is across care. I recommend to everybody, there was a wonderful article in the New Yorker called The Cost Conundrum, where they actually, balance, they actually looked at the most expensive you know, health care system. Until go on these articles. Yes, yes, and the cheapest. And what they found was it wasn't related to cost, but it was related to a better management of care system. So once we get to that, we don't have five doctors who don't really talk to each other coming in, then there will be a better single point of contact. And that will help um, with you know, those who are in the sandwich generation. The second piece on that will, it will have to take some different behaviors amongst the Woodstockers. In all honesty, three out of five baby boomers, you know, were going to run out of cash long before they need it, and they're one crisis away, health crisis away from economic ruin. So there is that kind of tension. The good news is, is because it used to be end of life conversations in these cities were almost taboo to have because people didn't want to put a value on life, like they're doing in the UK, by the way, with their national institutes on um, <coughs> clinical excellence. But that is actually going to come to the forefront. So I think we'll see some better things coming through health care reform and policy that will help that sandwich generation, generation squeeze. Yes, sir. My dad was a family physician. Uh, he, he, had, he viewed it as part of his role to help mediate those issues within a family because he really believed that that's part of what a family physician is about. Um, and, and so I think that there is a role for physicians to play who are the, in a sense, often the authority figure in that uh, situation to be able to help guide and have and that, the family to a good decision. And, and work through that because that is natural human emotion that, that they're dealing with. What I think has, has happened and what our, our research suggests is that so very few physicians have a clue about how to do that. Um, and, and so, and they, and, they, and they are greatly fearful of it. Uh, in, in, at OHSU in, in Oregon, we have a very specific program that we help fund at the children's hospital there. Uh, and boy, if you think it's tough with an aging parent, now let's talk about a child and the kinds of in, in, dynamics between husband and wife. Yes. Uh, my name is Grace Bender, and I have given all of you a product called Monomed Manager, which um, is very well set. Um, it was designed because of my mother, who was on 16 prescriptions for 
But is it part of that fine line because you were an advocate and you had already had those conversations? Yes. Because we, we talk about death and dying so poorly in this country. Well, both my parents have given me the, the uh, power of attorney for their health care as well as they have living wills. So I, I knew and understand and understood that. But I, I just think that there are two kinds of people. And, and one other comment I want to say about my mother. She was in that hospital and I was looking at her medications and Lipitor was fabulous, but she was dying. And I said, why is she on Lipitor? And they said, it's for many connection with the families and the issue of dying when you let go, the, we're multicultural. We talk, heard about it more and more. And the, the different cultures have different attitudes towards it. In the Borough Park community, okay, you're not allowed, almost religiously, to let a parent go. They will not sign. They do not resuscitate. They will go to a cardiac surgeon, 90, 91 years old, and insist on surgery. So what then? Where's the line then for a physician or a hospital to say no? And the, uh, you can't do anything about the DNC, but on the cardiac you can. I mean, you can well, on the two things. First of all, we deal with the rabbis. Good, good. We, we go as a cultural matter, and we have we have a, a big hospital, a lot of community people from it who understand it. So they focus with the rabbis to to drive it down so that it becomes acceptable for DNC and the whole culture. It's a cultural issue. Okay, I'm giving you one example. The Chinese have other issues, but in that particular example, when you get to the cardiac surgery, you have peer review, you have the doctor just put it on, uh, and we, we're more and more declining to do it. Uh, but we have had to do really tough procedures to prevent the surgeons who have known these families forever. Okay, I mean, it's not they're not strangers. These in this particular community, they're tight knit, but okay, but the hospital is moving more and more to clamping down on the issue, uh, not only for economic reasons, but also the bad outcomes are terrible. When they, and, and yet you do have, there was an example only about a month ago of a 91-year-old patient did get operated on, was successful for however long that will be. We have time for two more questions. 
Do not resuscitate. Two more questions. Yes, ma'am, and then yes, sir. Um, first, I have to say, I went to Woodstock when I was your attrition, so I think those are pretty... I remember seeing you. Blood-sided health reform, saying that it was being launched against older people, and that this and they're demagoguing the whole issue as Obama saying the D to die. There was a, a and there's a, it's a it's, it's been a euthanasia argument. It's been a euthanasia argument, and it's wrong. And right. the conversation is all wrong. I saw that same op-ed piece. I spoke to Mark Warner. There are five bills in the House and Senate. I spoke to Mark Warner who has one of the strongest bills out there in the last week, and he said he cannot get one co-sponsor because it's a radioactive issue on Capitol Hill. And I think that this is a fundamental issue. We have to figure out a way using that ground up to get past this, but this is really serious. And I'm gonna take your question, sir. If we, did you have a question also, uh, a yeah, comment? Sorry, I have one question for John. Uh, Mark's Yes, he or she can be taught better. No, I'm not sure that they can internalize it. There, there are two things that make an age cohort. One is the historical period in which they operate. The other is the life cycle. The 20-somethings are always going to be 20-somethings. They're still going to light up a cigarette. You know, They're still going to feel that they're invulnerable, and they're still not going to understand what it means to be 85 years of age. But they can be taught better, absolutely. We're do, and Don, we're doing it. I mean, at OHSU, that's uh, for the last five years, we've been training uh, young physicians and nurses and the like. It can be done. It, it, it is not easy because it's, again, it's a, it, it's a cultural shift. I'd like to see it being done in medical schools and residencies more effectively. And on that note, thanks to my panelists. Thanks for the story. Thank you. Thank you.